Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this virology session of Varsity Ski this evening. And um, we do have two very exciting talks lined up for you. So our first one is from Pong, who is a PhD student, and she'll be talking about, as you can see on your screen, about HIV maturation inhibitors. Uh, following that talk, uh, we will have uh, a talk about transposable elements and gene regulation by uh, Elster. So um, without any further ado, I'll hand over to our first speaker. Hey everyone, so my name is Fong and um, this is my previous work at the NIH before I came to the pharmacology department here to work on some COVID related studies. And so today I'll be presenting on the resistant pathways for a new class of anti-HIV drugs known as maturation inhibitors. Next. And so over 36 million people um, worldwide are infected with HIV. And although combinational antiretroviral therapy has been very effective at helping people reduce the uh, um, virus symptoms, the drugs does not uh, treat or clear the virus completely. And as a result of this, long-term therapy is needed. So what comes with long-term therapy is drug resistance, drug toxicity, and um, there's a lot of issues with uh, drug resistance that we still need to uh, explore and understand in order to better develop uh, novel anti-HIV drug compounds. And so what's shown on the slide is Bevermat. Um, this was the first in-class HIV-1 maturation inhibitor. And what it does is that it binds to the poly-gag uh, protein at the capsid SP1 region. And so by binding to this region, it blocks protease from coming to the site and successfully cleaving the protein into its um, functional structures. And so because of this blockage, what you get are non-infectious virion particles. On the right, you see the gel as well as the graph, um, which depicts the uh, effects of Bevarimat um, in virus in cells that are treated with um, Bevarimat, you see that there is a dark capsid SP1 band, which correlates to the amount of non-infectious uh, immature uh, virion particles. Next. And so ulti ultimately, Bevarimat actually went into clinical trials and uh, um, it went into phase 2B of clinical trials, and 50% of patients were unresponsive to the drug. And um, because of certain polymorphs within this SP1 region, most notably a valine to an alene change at position 7, um, this actually caused the compound to be unresponsive to 50% of the patients. And as a result of this, um, the clinical development of the HIV-1 maturation inhibitors were put on hold. Next. And so as you can see from this uh, figure, uh, highlighted in red is the valine to alanine change at position seven that caused the Veramat to be non-responsive to a lot of patients. And most of these uh, mutations that arose were all within the capsid SP1 region. Next. And so next, our goal in the lab was to develop the Veramat analogs that would more effectively inhibit HIV-1 replication, but would also display broader activity against different virus strains that possess this SP1 polymorph. Next. And so here is a structure of um, the second generation maturation inhibitor. And so this was a collaborative effort uh, between Panicles as well as DFH Pharma and over 500 analogs were synthesized during this time. And circled in red is carbon-28. Changes made to uh, this specific site somehow made the second generation maturation inhibitors more potent um, compared to its parent analog. Next. And so here is like a specific screen that uh, we've completed. And so on the left, it's showing the percent of capsid SP1 accumulation 
And on the bottom, you see DMSO is the negative control, the Verimat, the positive control against 10 different uh, candidates. And so against both wild type as well as the mutant V7A, you see that our compounds are able to block virus activity as measured by a high level of capsid SP1 percentage. Next. And so these uh, Bavarimet analogs were also active against the SP1 V7A. And you can see that for Bavarimet, which is circled, the IC50 value for Bavarimet, which is circled or highlighted in red, is about 500 nanomolar. And if you look at 7M, 7R, as well as 7S, these compounds show potent activity that are about tenfold, no, 50 fold, 50 fold. Um, more or more potent than the Veramet itself. Next. And so here, uh, what we next did was that we also developed IC50 assays against the primary isolates in PBMC cells. And so compared to the different subtypes, um, B, C, D, all the way to O, you see that our compound 7R is able to um, potently inhibit virus activity compared to the Veramet. Next. And so here we did another screening uh, assay, and this was against different uh, Breviramat resistant viruses that arose during the capsid SP1 region. And so you can see that compared to uh, Breviramat, both our compounds 7M and 7R, as highlighted in orange and green, um, show high level of um, virus um, inhibition compared to Breviramat. Next. And so in cell culture, we also uh, noted that these compounds are able to inhibit virus replication. So compared to wild type, the virus would peak around day five and our compounds would, with compound treated cells, then the virus would peak around day 26 or 25. So about almost a three week, three week full difference. Next. And so after so once the virus peaks, what we would do is we would sequence the, um, the cell supernatant to see uh, what mutations would arise during the drug selection process. And once we um, conducted the sequencing, we found certain mutations that arose during the capsid SP1 region. And these were also in the main homology region as well as the capsid SP1 region. And some of these changes include a P a proline to an alanine change, as well as an alanine to a valine change, which are actually very highly conserved. Next. And so here, um, so we there's like several different subtypes of HIV and H, HIV subtype B predominantly affects the Euro European population, whereas subtype C uh, is more dominant, more than 50% of Patients across the world have this, and it's more dominant. And um, you would find this more in like African countries. And so, what we did here was that we also um, conducted our capsid SP1 accumulation assays against the mutations that arose in subtype C. And what we see is that our compounds um, at 100 and 500 nanomolar concentrations were able to effectively inhibit virus activity compared to. The Veramat. Next. And so here is a crystal structural model of the capsid SP1 6 helix bundle, as well as the location of the mutations that were selected in subtype C. So in gray is the capsid region, and then in the cyan blue is the SP1 region. The green um, are the mutations, and our compound 7M and 7R hypothetically would dock inside the six helix bundle and by block or by docking in the central area, somehow our compounds are able to stabilize the immature gag lattice. And this prevents um, the protease from coming to the site to cleave the uh, structural proteins of gag, ultimately resulting in non-infectious particles. Next. And so here is a summary slide of what I've uh, spoke to you about. And so what we found in summary was um, a set of C28 alkyl amine derivatives of Deveramat that showed 
uh, low nanomolar activity across major plates of HIV. And these compounds were able to um, show activity against SP1 polymorph viruses that displayed reduced susceptibility to the parent compound, Bevarimab. And um, these second generation maturation inhibitors um, were able to retain some of the activity against the HIV-1 isolates that were selected for resistance to Bevarimab. And um, some of the mutations arose in highly conserved regions, including the capsid major homology region in both subtype B as well as subtype C. And then in capsid SP1 accumulation assays, we were able to see that um, our compounds were able to inhibit most of the virus mutants. And um, the next thing that we would do is uh, we would test this in, um, we're, we would test this in more patient samples. Um, and currently we're collaborating with another company and our compound is entering phase 2B of clinical trials. Um, yeah, that's about it. This is acknowledgement. Thank you for everyone who's been listening and I'm open to questions. Um, so, hi, um, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm Yi Sing and I will be moderating the Q&A session. Um, so just feel free to post your questions on Zoom or if you're on YouTube, just um, feel free to post it on the live chat. So uh, I have one question here. Mm, so the person asking is not, uh, not very familiar with uh, virology, but uh, interested. Um, so the person asked, um, how how common is maturation inhibitor um, among like other viruses? So maturation inhibitors, so for a virus life cycle, so the virus has to, of course, enter the cell, replicate, and then eventually it, there is a maturation step where the protein needs to be cleaved in order for the virus particles to be mature. So maturation is important in virus life cycle in a broad, you know, like a broad um, population of viruses. Thank you. So um, some questions from the, from YouTube. Um, so Lilith said, I have read some research paper developing means to model possible viral mutations to gain resistance against any one antiviral drug computationally. Therefore, is it possible to use this data to design, um, design in inverted commas, variants of new drugs with changed chemical structures so that they can be evolution proof, i.e. active against many more possible mutations? I think this participant just answered um, their own question. It's uh, yes, the answer is yes. Definitely the mutation studies here can be used for computational designs. And um, so, yeah, thank you. Any more, any more questions? Um, if you're on Zoom, you could ask your questions in person as well. Okay, there's one on Zoom. Have strains been found that do show this resistance? Are there strains? Yeah, are there strains found that do show this resistance? So we've done a patient, we've the like sequence patient samples as well. And in patient samples, there are strains of these mutations found within patient samples, which ultimately adds to the importance of our work um, because it ultimately provides more insight into the mechanism of how HIV developed resistance to these drugs and will ultimately provide more insight into more novel development of own drugs. Um, thank you. So um, if there are any more questions, um, I'm pretty sure um, Wong would be able to answer it later, maybe after the second um, talk. 
So I guess I'll now move on to the um, second top. So, okay. I'll um, pass the floor to Christoph. So uh, for our second talk today, uh, we will have a talk on, um, again, of course, uh, as this is the virology session, uh, we are going to have a talk on transposable elements and gene regulation entitled Very Viral. So I'll pass the floor to Elsa, who will be our next speaker. Thank you very much, Christoph. I'll just share my screen. Can everyone see this? Yep. Yeah, all good. Nice. Okay, good evening, everyone. Well, the following talk has been inspired from my undergraduate as well as my MPhil lectures and the research I have done as part of it. I will give a very brief overview of a topic which I personally find very exciting transposable elements. So, there are three main things we all know about viruses. The first one being that they're obligate intracellular parasites, meaning they, unlike bacteria, cannot reproduce on their own, but instead hijack other organisms to fulfill that purpose. We also know that viruses are incredibly small, much smaller than bacteria. They are submicroscopic particles, which can have an enormous impact on many levels, as we all know. Viruses also come in various sh shapes, but what unites all of them is that they consist of genetic material, be it RNA or DNA. What scientists are less clear about is where exactly they come from, or better said, their evolutionary origin. There are three main hypotheses that try to address this mystery. The regressive hypothesis postulates that viruses were once self-sufficient entities that infected other organisms, but were not reliant on them, up to the point where the genes that they were no, no longer using were simply lost. The co-evolution hypothesis, in turn, is also known as the virus-first hypothesis, and proposes that viruses could have evolved from complex molecules of protein and nucleic acid at the same time that the cell first appeared on Earth. However, this talk is linked to the cellular origin hypothesis, which states that some viruses may have evolved from bits of DNA or RNA that escaped from genes of larger organisms. Now, you might ask yourself how exactly genetic material can escape, as it implies some sort of mobility. But then again, most of you might already be familiar with the concept of so-called jumping genes or transposons. Molecules of DNA that replicate and are capable to move around the genome for which Barbara McClintock over here, seen in the picture, was awarded um, the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 1983. Stri strikingly, these genetic elements make up to an astonishing 42% of our human genome and up to 90% of the maize human genome, which was also the model organism Barbara used for her initial research. So overall, there are two major types of transposons, class one, class two. Each have different mechanisms by which they accomplish moving around in our genome. Class one transposons include long interspersed nuclear elements, lines, and short interspersed nuclear elements, signs. And class two are DNA transposons. As you can see in the diagram over here, Retrotransposons are initially transcribed from DNA to RNA, and the, the produced RNA is subsequently reverse transcribed to DNA, which is inserted back into the genome at a new position. The reverse transcription step is catalyzed by reverse transcriptase, which is often encoded in the, T in the trans transposable element itself. As a result, these characteristics might seem very familiar to retroviruses such as HIV, which we just saw in the previous talk. Again, these mobile elements and their abundance are really quite striking considering that the protein coding regions make up less than 1% of our genome. So let's take a closer look at human endogenous retroviruses or HERVs. These are footprints of previous retroviral infections 
which are inherited in a successive, by successive generations in a Mendelian manner. The activity has also been implicated to be associated with the induction of gen genomic instability, although currently there, are no there is no conclusive evidence on whether HERVs are causative or promoting agents in cancer cancerogenesis. But how exactly can TEs induce genomic stability? Well, as you can imagine, the prospect of genes randomly shuffling around your genome is rather unsettling. And indeed, there are instances where, for example, a transposon can insert itself into a functional gene and disable it, as seen in the diagram over here. Nevertheless, most of them have become inactive through mutations or host epigenetic silencing via DNA methylation, which serves as a defense against those mo mobile elements. So DNA methylation is a process by which met methyl groups are added to DNA. And this, molecule, this modification is catalyzed by the enzyme DNMT, seen over here, and then DNA methyltransferase. Um, DNMT changes the activity of a DNA segment without changing the sequence, hence it is epigenetic. When located in a gene promoter, DNA methylation typically acts to repress gene transcription. This mechanism can also be leveraged in cancer therapies using DNMT inhibitors. When DNMT is no longer able to add methyl groups to DNA and ERVs are transcribed. However, these ERVs are detected by special receptors in our immune system known as danger-associated molecular patterns, or DAMPs, which upon ligand binding, trigger an intracellular cascade, which results in the transcription and expression of antiviral proteins called interferons. Now, interferons are quite small, and there are broadly speaking three classes or types of them, which can be expressed by different cells. In a similar manner to DAMPs, these proteins bind to their cognate receptor and trigger another cellular cascade, which results in more antiviral proteins being produced. And these are called interferon-stimulated genes, or short ISGs, and they are highly specialized to target viral infection at every stage, as seen over here. So you have the um, penetration and then the on-coating, as well as maturation, as we just mentioned, endocytosis attachment, and then this whole cycle continues again. Now what we can see in red, red stars, are those ISGs, which prevent each step from happening. These viral proteins also are able to ramp up our immune system and cause it, causing it to be better at recognizing cancerous cells and thereby promote their destruction. And this effect is referred to as viral mimicry. Overall, the main points I wanted to bring up is that our genome is not static and that remnants of past viral infections still influence the way our body functions. Viral mimicry can be used to enhance anti-tumor activities. And that finally, frankly, there is a lot left to explore. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you, Elsa, for your talk. So um, maybe I'll, so I personally, um, I didn't quite get the ERV part. Um, is it just, same as HERV. Yes. So so um so HERV is in human. Exactly. Is that correct. Okay. Um. Back to that. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Yes. So HRV is specifically in humans, but because viruses can infect uh, any organism, really then you have endogenous retroviruses within other, like plant genomes, for example, as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm just um, monitoring questions um, from YouTube. All right, there's one question on Zoom. Would you mind elaborating on some theories of how HERV HERVs could be a cause of or could be a cause or symptom of genomics instability. Yeah, sure. 
So if you imagine, um, so you know, you probably know about tumor suppressor genes and tumor um, promoting genes. So if you have something that is able to insert itself into a tumor suppressor gene, you can imagine that you are more likely to suffer from um, lesions in your DNA, which are no longer being repaired due to uh, problems with your cell cycle regulation, or as well um, cells starting to proliferate because that uh, oncogene is no longer able to um, do its job. So that's that's one possibility. Another one, um, there are lots, again, the, the um, cell cycle checkpoints, those types of genes, um, if you have an insertion or just duplication of, of genetic material, then that gene is no longer able to function. And that predisposes you to um, increased level of gen genomic instability, which ultimately can result to cancer. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, so one question from YouTube from Lilith. The origin of transposons are quite controversial. Some say that they are remnants of ancient ritual viruses. Others believe that viruses have evolved from them. Which hypothesis do you agree with? <laughs> um, yeah, that, that is correct. Uh, it is very controversial. And I think, um, personally, I think there might be uh, truths in both hypotheses. Obviously, this is very hard to um, to reconcile with because uh, you, you'd like to think, okay, if something was there at the start, then obviously that's the origin of everything. I personally don't know. I don't know enough, uh, haven't read enough into um, the origin of transposons, but it's very interesting. Thank you. And um, thank you. Um... So I guess if there are no more questions, we would wrap up here. Um, thank you very much, um, Elsa and Fong, for their talks. Um, so, so this is the last session of our Varsity Ski Symposium for today. There are four more days full of events and uh, full of talks. So hope to see you all in the next few days um, and have a great evening.